We turn this morning uh, not to Matthew's account of Jesus' birth or of Luke's, which are, of course, the most common, uh, but instead to John's reflection on Jesus' birth. And we're going to read John chapter 1. We'll read the first 18 verses, but we're going to focus in uh, especially on verse 16. And as we open now God's Word on this Christmas morning, let's first bow our heads in prayer. Father, we have come indeed to worship this newborn King. And so, Father, open this Word and tell us all about Him again. Tell us of Your glory, of Your grace, of Your your gift of your love. Help us to so see it, to so experience it, to so believe it, that it would transform us here and now and send us out different people. And so, Father, pour out again your Holy Spirit that we can see, see this Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and yet And the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness... We have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. So far the reading of God's holy word. People of God, I, I often wonder what it is about, about stories that grips us so much, about a good book or, or a good movie. And why is it that certain stories, what become almost mythical stories, what perhaps we often call now fairy tales, why do they stick with us generation after generation? Uh, we were relaxing as a family this week, and a few of us were sitting together. I was with the kids. We were watching Sleeping Beauty, a story about a Maleficent, an evil dragon in the form of a person whose jealousy and pride causes them to curse the daughter of the king, threatening this living death. But the son of another king finds her and falls in love with her, and Maleficent tries to capture him and keep them apart forever. But with his shield of virtue and his sword of truth, He defeats the evil dragon and saves the princess by his true love. It's not so unlike Snow White, another favorite, where another jealous evil curses a princess by assuming a false identity and and lying to her to get her to eat a cursed apple. 
and delivers her also into this living death. And again, the prince comes, and by his virtue and valor, he delivers her from evil and makes her come alive again by his love. In fact, many of the older stories are like that. Good versus evil, this, this evil presence that threatens death through a curse, this valiant and noble prince who fights for his beloved and who ultimately sets her free, defeating evil, bringing back life and hope so they can, as it always says, so they can live happily ever after. I think those stories resonate so deeply with us because they are really, they are really little versions of the story. Because there is, as we have seen in Genesis, a great evil, an ancient dragon called Satan or the devil, who uses indeed false identities to convince the princess, God's elect people, the church, the human race, and Adam and Eve, to fall into this living death by eating the fruit and falling under this great curse. And all because of this, this jealousy, this, this rebellion, and this war in heaven. But then we hear this story that the king has his son, his only begotten son. And the king so loves the world that he sends his son into the world to save it, to save her, to save the church. The elect, his bride, the princess. And so the prince comes with truth and grace to come and deliver his beloved by his deep love. But of course, that story doesn't begin with the evil, though, like most fairy tales often do. The story, in fact, begins in eternity, we've seen, where the father decided already before he made us that his son would indeed marry his future bride, the church, and defeat anything and anyone who would come in the way of their happily ever after. But unlike the fairy tales, when the prince comes, he is not a knight in shining armor, but he comes as a baby in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes because there was no room for them in the inn. He comes both so much greater and, and if we're honest, so much lesser than we would have expected. On one side, he's the eternal God, the Son of God, the Word that was in the beginning, who was with God and who was God, through whom all things were made, in whom was life, and that life was the light of men. With this great prince of the world, the son of the king, who is infinitely holy and wise and almighty and glorious, he comes, he comes so humbly. He comes powerless. He comes helpless. He comes tiny as a baby. And when he comes, his, his own don't receive him. And though he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over creation, by whom all things were created, who was before all things and whom all things hold together, and yet he comes, he comes, it says, as a servant. The Almighty, as a helpless babe. John says this word has become flesh. And John says that because he's seen it with his own eyes. He, he's touched him with his own hands. He, he's heard him with his own ears. That the one who was with God at the beginning, John knew and walked with and talked with. And John's claim here, John's claim that the Word became flesh, flesh and made his dwelling among us, it, it sets Christianity apart from every other religion. You know, we've been studying some world religions in my catechism class. You know, if you could prove that, you know, Gautama the Buddha never lived, you wouldn't destroy Buddhism. It's, it's, it's not based upon any person. Or, or if you could prove that one of the Hindu gods, like Krishna, doesn't exist, you wouldn't destroy Hinduism. There are millions more gods. If we were talking to a local imam, and we asked him, could God have given the Quran to somebody other than Muhammad. Now, he might argue at first that God didn't do that, but, but ultimately he would say, of course. 
Allah could have given that revelation to anybody because the important thing was the message, not the messenger. Mormonism would stay the same if it was anybody other than Joseph Smith who found those stone tablets. Every other religion is like that. It's a message. But when it comes to Christianity, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It's not even coherent to ask if God could have given his message to somebody else. Because Jesus is not a messenger. Jesus is the message. The light enters the darkness and becomes a human being. See, if you could prove that Jesus didn't exist, Christianity would be utterly destroyed. In fact, Paul says even if you could prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith would be of no value. Our entire faith is reliant on the reality, on the the truth of the person and the actions and the life and the death and the resurrection of this baby born in a manger 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea, that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word of God came to His own, but His own did not receive Him. If you want to know what sin is, there it is. Sin is, is not first and foremost about murder or theft or, or lying. Those are bad things. But sin is, is about this, we could say, that the de-godding of God. Not recognizing or acknowledging Him. Not giving God His, his due. And God keeps trying to pull his people back, but it turns out in the Old Testament, no amount of words, no number of prophets, no matter how wonderful the law is, it's not sufficient. And so God doesn't send another message. God sends a person. The person. And that's John's point here. That God's truth, God's glory, God's grace, his power, his honor, his strength come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God dwells in Him. So the message becomes not believe this or or know this or do this. If you want to know truth, look at Jesus. If you want to find mercy, look at Jesus. God was pleased to have all of His fullness dwell in Him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's in this person of Jesus, this baby in the manger, that we receive, it says, the fullness of God's grace. That word grabs me every time I read it. I I just can't get away from it, this idea of fullness. John has this parallel expression a sentence later that, that we get grace upon grace. Or, or even more precisely in the Greek, grace instead of grace. Grace and then more grace and then more grace and then more grace. And there's no question that John is alluding here to a story from Exodus 32 to 34. Perhaps many of you know that story. In, in, in chapter 32 of Exodus, Moses comes down from the mountain with the tablets of the law, and he, he finds them with a golden calf, and he smashes those tablets, and God threatens to destroy the people. But Moses intercedes on their behalf, and, and Moses reminds God, remember that this nation is your people. I, I can't do this. I can't lead them. They belong to you, and so you need to save them. And God says, okay, I'll, I'll save them, but, I, but I, can't, I can't dwell with you, lest I destroy them. But again, Moses intercedes, and God relents. And God, from that moment on, promises that he will dwell with his people in the tabernacle. And he sets up this elaborate system of ceremonies and laws in the Old Testament, so that can happen temporarily. And then Moses, when all that is done, Moses says, Now, God, show me your glory. And God says, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. 
And he hides Moses in the cleft of that rock. And he passes by. He allows Moses just to, just to see the train of his robe as he passes by. And then he identifies himself as he, as he goes by Moses, the Lord. The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding full of love and faithfulness. And those, those words, that identity of God, becomes this theme in the Old Testament, repeated over and over and over again, that God is full of love and faithfulness. In the Old Testament, chesed v'emet. And, and they're, they're translated all kinds of ways because nothing quite grasps all of it. But when they get translated into Greek and then into, from Greek into English, we could equally translate them that God is full of grace and truth. John is making an extraordinary claim here that the Word became flesh and He dwelt, He tabernacled among us. We have seen His glory full of grace and truth, the glory of the great I Am that Moses met on that mountain, full of chesed v'emet, abounding in love and faithfulness. And John is saying, you think that God manifested Himself in previous times? You think God was in the tabernacle? You think He appeared to Moses on that mountain? You think that shaking mountains is impressive or, or smoke and trumpet blasts? God says, let me, let me tell you how I'm really going to come among you about the true tabernacle. He says, the real glory will come in Jesus. And that's what John alludes to in, in verse 17 here, talking about Moses and the giving of the law. But this time, it doesn't come veiled. This time it's not just from behind. This time it's not just the one person. John says, we, we, plural we, have seen his glory and his whole gospel testifies to it. The very next chapter in, in Jesus' first miracle, it says they saw his glory. And it carries all the way through this gospel of John until finally Jesus himself says, Father, glorify me. And he's talking there about his cross. It's the mystery of Christmas that God in all of his glory and all of his fullness comes in the form of a baby that we can't even begin to comprehend. But then even more glorious is that this baby would not only live, but that this baby that God would die for his people. Show me your glory. God says, just, just look at what I'm going to do in my son. I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. See Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Yes, we received grace in the law of Moses, but now we've, re we've received grace instead of grace, grace upon grace. Then it was just in part, but now completely. Then we saw in a glass dimly, but now we see fully. From the law of Moses, we only knew that we needed a Savior. But from the grace of the Word made flesh, we receive the fullness, the completeness, the culmination of God's love and God's grace and God's truth. Reverend John Piper speaks about the day that that, that word really sank in for him. He was, it was one of those, those epiphany moments that this word fullness carried a fullness. Some, some idea of what that could possibly mean, the wonder of it. it has such an impact and it continues to. Why? Because the one from whom fullness comes is the word that was with God and who was God. Jesus' fullness is God's fullness, a divine fullness, an infinite fullness that has no limit or end. But this fullness becomes word, becomes flesh, and comes and seeks after us, and it pursues us. He comes in human form so we could see his glory. It's accessible. And it was mediated, not, not just from God, but it's mediated through God. God sends his own son to deliver that fullness. 
And it's a fullness of grace. It's not a fullness of condemnation. It's a fullness of grace. Blessing forevermore. And it's a fullness of truth. It's rock-solid reality. In Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, Colossians 2 says. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, Colossians 1 says. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Or in Ephesians, Paul prays that that we may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth indeed to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Why? So that we too can be filled with all the fullness of God. The fullness of God is available to us as we have strength to comprehend the love of Christ in its fullness, in its height and depth and length and breadth. We find the fullness of God in the experience of the fullness of Jesus' love for us. Not only can fairy tales come true, it has come true that we, the people living in darkness, we who were the bride, the church, the chosen ones of God, his beloved, we were indeed deceived by a maleficent evil, a great dragon, and we ate the fruit and we live under a curse, this living death. But people of God, the king's son has been sent to rescue us. And he's done it. And we, how could we ever deserve it? We have received grace upon grace from his fullness. Unending, unquenchable grace. You know, one of the greatest preachers of the early church, St. John Chrysostom, he wrote that Jesus is himself the very fountain, the very root of all good, very life, very light, very truth, not retaining within himself the riches of his good things, but overflowing with them unto all others. And after Jesus overflows, he remains full in nothing diminished by supplying others but streaming ever forth and imparting to others a share of these blessings. He remains in sameness of perfection. And so Chrysostom says, what what I, what we possess by participation, we just receive it from another. It's just a a small, a tiny portion of the whole, as he says, like, like like a raindrop compared with the boundless ocean. But he says not even that really compares because if you took a drop from the sea, the sea would yet be diminished even though it would be imperceptible to us. But he says of that fountain, we can say this, how much soever a man draws, it continues undiminished. In other words, there is no end to that fullness. We will never, we will never find him dry. Grace upon grace, grace after grace forever. Infinite in quality, infinite in quantity. And that's, that's the hope of Christmas. That's, that's my prayer for you this Christmas, that you and your family would also experience this fullness of grace, the fullness that we find in this baby in the manger, that you would know in the heart of in your heart of hearts, this this outpouring of grace. The glory of the only Son from the Father. That he might shine also into your hearts to give you the light of the knowledge of his glory. That you could again be amazed that Christ, the Word made flesh, would, would give you himself It is a fairy tale that the prince, the son of the king, has come for you. That you are indeed that beautiful princess that the church is, the bride, for whom Jesus lived and fought and died and rose and reigns. And the promise is that he has indeed defeated that ancient dragon. And he has set us free from our captivity. And he takes us to himself. 
so we can prepare for the wedding in the new creation, where indeed we will live happily ever after, receiving their grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace forever and ever. Amen. May God so grant you that vision this Christmas. Let's pray together. Father, in this world yet bent under sin and under its weight, where so often sorrows pour upon us, help us to find again this Christmas, in this baby in a manger, all of your fullness. God, in, in bodily form, come for us, come to rescue us, come because he loves us. That he has come and he has done it. And it is finished. And though we still feel the effects of the curse, its sting has been taken away and its, its grip on us has been loosened. And we have indeed been made new. Father, make us new again today. Fill us with this hope. Fill us with grace upon grace upon grace till it also overflows from us into all that we are and all that we say and all that we do. Father, we long for that day when Jesus comes back so we can be forever with him in the fullness of his presence. Our Christmas prayer is indeed, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we close, I invite you to stand. People of God, as we go forth, may indeed the grace and the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen. Let's sing as we close, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs>